So, have you ever been, like, eating something, and you, like, cough, or even just, like, breathe weird, and a little bit goes up your nose, like, the back, like your sinuses? Totally, yeah. Yeah, so that just happened to me, so if I sound a little weird or sniffle a lot, <laughs> it, and, <laughs> spoilers, it was, uh, it was Wendy's cheeseburger. Uh, so, yeah, so- I've got, I've got a little cheeseburger in my schnoz right now. So uh, just for clarification for everybody, I was told to pause on the whole "Hey everybody," so I that is get a reaction out yeah. of whatever Gavin had for us, and I thought it was something real profound or something. Oh no! Was, it was the fact that there was cheeseburger in his nose, and I'll tell you what: there's nothing I want more than that. Absolutely. <laughs> so with that, go ahead and intro oh. us, Mike. Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode 50 of I Wish You Were Dead, a podcast about things that used to be alive. We made it to 50. Yes. And I don't have my microphone again, and I don't care. We sure did. Episode 50. What a time to be alive. Not quite our one year, which I do have something special planned for that. So uh, keep an eye out in uh, in two weeks for our sort of one year anniversary. Um, But... This is going to be a really interesting episode, an episode I've been wanting to do for a long time, or at least like sort of starting to do, and I'll explain what I mean by that uh, once we actually get into the episode, but uh, today I have a couple of just general housekeeping things uh, before we get started, so no uh, calendar, thank God, uh, we don't need to do a this, you know, today in history or whatever, because uh, this is going to take up a little bit of time, so. Let's do it. Uh, so first of all, uh, we are currently sort of fostering like a little puppy um so you may or may not hear her in the back how does sort of fostering work so um liz my partner uh works for animal like the county animal control and uh sometime last week uh that like the like kennel side of animal control like they, they got in this little maybe a little less than two month old puppy like that they found either it was stray or like the mom was stray. I don't know one way or another ended up, it ended up in like the kennel side of the, like the County animal control. And mm-hmm. they were going to just kind of leave her like overnight. And she was oh, wow. not in shape to do that. So, uh, yeah, my, so Liz basically decided to, take it upon herself to bring her home. And so she's been back and forth, you know, a good handful of times. So, uh, but she's doing much better. She was very, very uh, like malnourished and like entirely skin and bones, like to the point where we didn't really know if she was going to make it. We think she's going to do pretty well now. She's doing much better. She's at least like eating on her own now, which is really good. Uh Um, So anyway, long story short. Good for you guys. Good for Liz. I mean, that's, that is hard mm-hmm. to do, as I found out with, you know, my girlfriend, who is, you know, mm-hmm. she's adopted, you know, a foster dog now that is, you know, she's a, she's a foster dog for a reason. Yeah. You know, it's, well, you know, it, it's, it's nice no that joke. it's nice that she's a puppy and like literally like she still can't really. But um, she mm-hmm. when we got her, especially she can't really like even like walk on her own. She's like that <laughs> malnourished. So, so the trauma might not be entirely ingrained yet. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So anyway, long story short, if you hear a small puppy in the background, that's why. Um, So yeah, that's the first piece of housekeeping news. Second piece of housekeeping news. Wonderful. Um, This is, I mentioned to Mike, uh, most of the things that I have for this little housekeeping session uh, are podcast related. This is the one that's not. Uh, uh, Last week, uh, I got engaged. I was going to talk about this last week. (laughs) You know what's amazing about this? is I have been dating my girlfriend. We're getting close to our three-year anniversary of, mm-hmm. uh, of dating. When this podcast started, I don't... Were you and your girlfriend dating? Were you and your fiancé now? Were you guys dating when this podcast first started? Yep. Not for super long. Like, what, a month or two? Yeah. Okay, so we are... You guys had been dating for a month or two, and you are now engaged, and uh, and girlfriend and I are yeah, going okay. three years. Yeah, but don't don't compare yourself to other people. You know, people's no, 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 relationships I, no, no, move I, at different rates. You know, this is no, 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 no. This is not me like comparing or anything. You know, no one's better or worse or anything. I just, I, I love the the different timelines uh, that people operate. It is fascinating to me how 
you know, how sometimes things move faster or they move slower. Uh, yeah. But I, I just couldn't be more happy for you. I couldn't be, even though I've never actually met Liz in real life, she will mm -hmm. on occasion before we start recording, start making some wonderful jokes <laughs> on the podcast. Yeah. And I just, you two, again, I've never met her. Maybe she's a horrible person for all, <laughs> but she, she just seems like she's made for you and you seem so happy. And I, I, I'm over the moon that you guys are together and things are, seems to be going you know, well enough that she said yes, which, you know, congrats on that. Yeah, thank you. And I'm not going to go into all the details behind it, but there's just some exciting life news. Uh, so, yeah. Anyway, with that uh, little ancillary detail out of the way, um, now some housekeeping things actually related to the podcast. So okay, yeah, I don't know what these are, so this is exciting. Mm -hmm. So, firstly, dear listeners, <laughs> I, I'd like to have a little heart to heart here for a minute. Oh boy. Because I'd like to ask a per Well yeah, you too. Um okay. I'd like to ask a personal favor. Share this podcast with somebody. Anyone or in particular. Or anybody in particular. Um or I guess oh. nobody in particular. But oh, okay. so uh I th this kind of thing, as I've mentioned a handful of times, is something that I would like to do maybe not like full time for my career. Like, obviously I would, I would love that, but I, I'm realistic about, you know, things. So, but something analogous to this or similar to this is something that I would like to do for my like long-term career. And so the whole reason of starting this podcast, other than talking to like one of my best friends every week uh, and, and, you know, myself getting to learn more about these different topics, because as, as much as I am, you know, the quote unquote content expert here, uh, I still learn a ton every week because it's not like I'm an expert in most of these episode topics, but this is also a little bit of like a portfolio for me. And the more people listen to it, the better feedback we can get, the better we can make the show, make it better for you all to listen to. And the more that Mike and I can be like, Hey, look at this thing we did. Look how impressive this is. Please get are still doing exactly. Please give me a job. Um, that's how jobs work, right? I mean, I, I look, at, I wouldn't know. <laughs> um, so yes, more interactions. If you listen to this on a podcast service that you can rate podcasts on, uh, I think Apple podcasts, you can still, do, still do that on. I'm not sure about other podcasts. Um, but that helps out like astronomically. Rate um, review. Absolutely. The old you know, like, and subscribe shtick. Um, and a great place where you can do that kind of thing or, you know, share the podcast is, uh, I believe we've had it for a while, but I don't think we've ever actually talked about it because I haven't done anything with it. But uh, the podcast has a Facebook. Uh, so we will be adding that to the list of things down in the show notes. Um, I'm going to be doing more with that and make it like an easier place for you to be able to share the podcast because, you know, various people use different, uh, you know, podcast apps. Uh, I believe Facebook now has a feature that you can actually listen to podcasts through Facebook. Mm -hmm. oh, I think. Okay. Um, so that'd be super cool. Uh, an easy way to share it, you know, to, to, you know, relatives, people that you know, or to other Facebook groups that you might be a part of. And lastly, something that Mike and I have talked about quite a bit, uh, but it's finally like literally as we're speaking, getting off the ground. Uh, we also started a YouTube channel. Uh, if you wanted to watch or share uh, the podcast there, which is also a really great way to interact with uh, us in general that, you know, we can immediately see your feedback. So we'll add that to the list of things down in the show notes as well. And a uh, funny story about the YouTube is that uh, YouTube, so say you upload five videos all to go out at the same time. They don't show up on your channel in the order in which you uploaded them. I assume it's just the order they finished like processing in. Nope, sometimes it's totally random. Oh, oh really? So, so say you upload five videos and you schedule them all to go out at like 10 PM. Mm -hmm. it, they will show up on your channel in a completely random order. <laughs> so uh, they are currently rolling out every 15 minutes because that's sort of the level of uh, like when YouTube, you can schedule things to go out. You can schedule it to go out like on the hour, like 10, 10, 15, 10, 30, 10, 45, so on. So every 15 minutes uh, for the past uh, at least like three, four hours, 
uh, there's been an episode going out, and that will continue uh, until sometime like tomorrow morning afternoon. Well, I guess today, this this morning afternoon. Um, okay. So yeah, so you can watch the process unfold live if uh, if that's your kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. So by the po- by the time this goes out, and most people listen to it like on their drive to work or something, um, most of the episodes will be available on YouTube. So uh, you can find that down in the show notes if you want to subscribe and you know give us some feedback. Episode topics would be excellent uh, and that kind of thing, just to help us make the podcast better for y'all. So that is all of my housekeeping things. Wonderful. And so we've got we've got engagements and dogs and YouTube channels and Facebook likes and and you know there's a lot of things lot going, going on, on here. Yeah. I'm excited. Lot going on. Yeah. So so with all of that, with all kind of the housekeeping, I guess we're ready to get to the actual topic of the day. Gavin, what are we talking about today? Today we are talking about one of the most interesting uh sections of geologic time. And that would be the Cambrian period. So most of the time when this period is mentioned, it is talked about in reference to an event during this period called the Cambrian explosion, which we'll talk about uh, in a bit of detail at the end. Um, so that's what this period is most famous for, but that's not why I particularly enjoy it. And also there's a lot of evidence suggesting that the explosion might not have been such a such of an explosion. Oh, all right. We get to get to some debunking, and Gavin has a, uh, a contradictory take. So this is yeah this is a classic episode. Yeah, absolutely. So way back in episode eight, way back in the day, that was the eight uh, six hundred million years in sixty minutes. The the first one. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say part one or part two. Part, part one. Um, okay. We talked about well in both of them. We talked about many geologic periods, but. The Cambrian was mentioned in the first of those two. Uh, and so we sort of glossed over all of the different periods for, you know, time-related reasons. There's a reason why we had to have two episodes. Uh, but arguably the most important, and in my opinion, one of the most interesting, is the Cambrian period, uh, which is a really, really big, just like time period for like all of the events of Earth history. And so a little background, the the Cambrian period starts at around 541 million years ago and ends uh, at around 485 million years ago. So like mid 500s to upper 400s million years ago. So a long, long time ago. And this was the first period of the Phanerozoic eon so in our episode about ge- the geologic time scale and geolo- like how we sort of work with geologic time uh, i mentioned that the largest scale that we use is the eon that is the biggest like chunk or unit of time that we use and so this period you know ushered in a new eon that we are still currently in So this was a major, major, super important time in Earth's history. So this was not all that long ago in geologic time, considering it starts the eon that we are still currently in, correct? Right. So in the grand scheme of things, you know, the Earth formed, you know, roughly 4.6 billion with a B years ago. Uh, And this was only about 500 and a half, you know, 550 or so million years ago. So this is a big chunk of time, but. Okay, right. So we're not like crazy, crazy long ago, but that's still a while, even on geologic time scales. Absolutely. And the reason that this period is so famous and why it was, you know, notable enough to end the previous eon and start a new one was because this is the first time, or so we thought for, for a very, very long time, uh, that we have large multicellular life. Because the previous eons had all were all notable for their lack of complex multicellular cellular life, sort of with with an asterisk. Um, but this Phanerozoic eon that, like like I said, that we are still currently in, and that started with the Cambrian period, uh, was the first time that we see like complex ecosystems and complex, you know, like predator prey relationships and different uh, a, a huge diversity of different 
you know, uh, you know, diversity in terms of, you know, like taxonomy, you know, like different groups showing up, but also a huge diversity in like body forms and like lifestyles of different animals. Uh, and it's very, very noticeable when it goes from the old stuff to the Cambrian period. That being said, you would recognize very, very little. If you took a time machine and traveled back to the Cambrian period, there's very few things that you would be able to look at, point to it and be like, oh, I know what that is. All of it was super weird, very, very alien looking. Um, but before we talk about the life, you know, this is a paleontology podcast, but um, as with everything, you need to understand like the geologic context and what's going on in the world in general before you understand what the life was doing, because all the geologic stuff uh, controls what life is sort of able to do. So, what was this world like? Everything about it was very, very alien. Um, there was little to no life on land at this point, which sounds very weird because that's where you and I and pretty much everything that most people are familiar with, that's where everything happens, right? Yeah, I, well, I I'm gonna hold my question until you get through this because I I have a very basic question, but I want no, you to go, go ahead. If, if if it's like a basic thing, uh, sh fire away. If you when you say alien, I am assuming this is not just like I would look around and be like, hmm, I don't recognize anything, but like I get in a time machine, mm -hmm. I travel back to 500 million years ago, I get out of the time machine. Am I dead just because like the you know, the contents of the atmosphere, you know, are not, you know, are not conducive to human life. Like, is there not enough oxygen in the atmosphere, I guess is what I'm asking at this time? Um, you'd be okay for a little while. Like, there's nothing, like, super noxious that would, like, you know, dissolve your skin or, you know, it's not like you were going to okay. Venus or something. Um, right. But as, we will cover it a little bit later. But, yeah, there was not as much oxygen in the air as there is now. Okay. All right, so it would be, it probably wouldn't be great that I was there, but I could get out of the time machine and live for a bit. If you had a scuba tank, you'd be fine. Okay. Um. So yeah, no, no life on land, with the exception of maybe some like microbes and stuff near like ocean shores, uh, but no land animals for sure. Uh, it's kind of been speculated that maybe there may have been some very early land plants at the very, very end of the Cambrian period, but there's not really any good evidence for that. It's just kind of been mm -hmm. speculated that based on the first plant life that we have confirmed, that you can kind of project that like, okay, maybe it needed, you know, this amount of time to be able to get to the point that at, at which we first see it. So it needed, we, we never have the first of something, even though to our knowledge, it's the first, there was always something before that, you know? So, uh, but by and large, especially if you got like a decent away from, uh, from like the coasts, every continent would look very, very alien, very rocky, uh, not even like mosses or anything. There might be like a little film of like bacteria on top of the rocks, but that would pretty much be it, which I assume no grass or anything, right? At this point, absolutely not. Yeah, um, okay. Nothing that you'd be able to see with just your eyes. And so that just in general makes land look very foreign because there's basically nowhere on earth you can go today to see that right it's it it's one of those things i assume it's technically possible for the conditions to exist somewhere on earth but it just doesn't like it's not like you can go somewhere and and see it right the only place that i could think of off the top of my head is like the very center of like the sahara desert where there's not really any plant life um, there are still animals there. Most of them just kind of hide below the sand, but, um, or like maybe like the very top of Mount Everest, if you're that far up, you can't really see 
there's there's not a ton of forests and things up that high you know um or on like any of the surrounding peaks but those are pretty much it and those are the harshest environments on the planet <laughs> so right and you know the night you know knowing our 100 percent of our audience unless you share this out like us on facebook you know has ever seen that right yeah and so even despite everything else about the continents being very weird and not like we see it today a lot of the same processes that are happening to the earth today were still happening then plate tectonics was still happening so we still had continents bumping into each other and building mountains and things like that uh the the erosion cycle was still happening it was very different but it was still happening so mountains were still being built they were still being torn down by erosion uh and part of the reason that the erosion cycle was so different was that uh plants play a major role in that today you know there's a reason why it's really good to uh you know plant trees and and have like good deep rooted grasses and things uh in areas that are prone to like landslides they help hold the soil together so if you get like a big rain or a flood all of that soil doesn't just get washed away mm -hmm. none of that was happening so there were no soils it was just lots and lots of just barren rock and you know gravel and sand uh, i'm assuming there was no like land animals at this point no, not even close. Right. Uh, and so the, the continents were so fundamentally different that like even stuff like rivers didn't look the same. So like the, the nice kind of traditional river that most people think of, you know, like a nice, like kind of lazy winding, like S shaped river. Those didn't exist. Cause those need plants to be holding the soil together so the water just doesn't plow right through it and take all that sediment away so all uh, of all of the rivers of that. Mm -hmm, all of the rivers on the planet were more or less uh they're called braided channels which is the kind of thing that you see from uh if you look at like a river that's right next to like a glacier right that's pretty much what it would be just very very shallow water just sort of running across the surface uh with with very little to, to slow it down, you know? So it's, it's very, you, you, you would go to that place and be like, Oh wow. Mars got wet. <laughs> that's what There's it would look on like. Mars. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but that, that's how foreign this would look to somebody who is used to seeing trees and grass and, you know, other plants everywhere. So, uh, yeah, but like, like I said, plate tectonics was still happening. And in fact, we actually had a supercontinent at this time as well. Sort of. Pangaea? Or is this pre-Pangaea? This was pre-Pangaea. Oh boy. I, I You've mentioned the name of the hypothesized like pre-Pangaea supercontinent, right? Mm-hmm. So I mentioned one. There were sort of... There, there's two that are important for like the context of this time. I'm trying to remember what the name of it might have been. It's very obscure, so don't don't at all feel bad. What does it start with? Uh, the one that I've mentioned before starts with an R. Yeah, I'm out. Sorry. That's okay. So, most of the continents were connected as a supercontinent called Panotia. Right. Not not the one that I've mentioned before. Um, and Panotia was the supercontinent right before Pangaea. So this was breaking up a, like throughout the Cambrian. Uh, okay. And even though we still have most of the same continents, and I say most because there are some continents that are notably missing from most reconstructions that I saw of Panotia, uh, you, you wouldn't recognize, even the ones that were there, you would not recognize their shape. As opposed to like when Pangaea broke up, you can still tell the outline of like, okay, here's South America, here's Africa, uh, here's Australia. You can still mm -hmm. mostly tell which continent that's going to end up being. You, yeah, you might as well just guess, and you're probably better off. <laughs> um, I assume right because you know it might be the same tectonic plate or mm -hmm. something close to it, but just I imagine the shape is just a total crapshoot. Yeah, absolutely. 
uh, because, you know, it's not like the North American plate. I don't even know if the North American plate was, uh, well, the, the, uh, the Pacific plate, I don't think even existed at this point. Really? Yeah. So the oldest continent, oh. the oldest, the oldest, uh, oceanic crust in the Pacific plate, I think is like Jurassic. So like at most like 180 or so a million years old. Wow. Okay. So yeah, the, the largest ocean did was not a thing, you so know, the, at this point. You know, the plates of the earth are not eternal. No, absolutely not. Especially the oceanic ones. And I imagine that the Pacific plate is the largest. I, I don't know how to um, that actually. I'm, I'm picturing a map of them in my head. Yeah, I think it is the largest like in terms of area although it kind of it depends on what map you look at map projections are very weird uh I, I, that's I an episode that i want to do things. That, that's something yeah, i want to oh. do an episode about at some point is maps i'm sure I, you have a lot to say about maps i have contemplated um having lessons on this in my classes i know there's other teachers including my cousin that does do a lesson on maps you know watch the west wing clip is yes probably absolutely the best thing i can tell you i i've i've taken a couple map making classes and mm-hmm. in both of them, we watched the clip from the West Wing. Uh, Absolutely. Anyway. Uh, I imagine you, it's one of those things that, like, you wind up with multiple answers depending on right. who you talk to and yeah. what you count. But, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, yeah. So, Panotia, the, the supercontinent that was breaking up throughout the, the Cambrian, uh, tr- roughly translates to... All south. That is what Panotia means. You know, like Pangea means all earth. Panotia means all south. Now, why that name? So this continent, the supercontinent, was more or less centered on the South Pole. Hmm. Is there a reason for that? It's just the way it happened. That's just the way it happened. Okay. So there was very little uh, landmass north of the equator almost all of it was south of the equator Mm -hmm. and as somebody from north america we typically think south means hot right until you go too far south exactly and so this is one of the rare times where we have complex life and also a fair amount of ice on the planet today is relatively special in that we have significant polar ice caps. That's not like a usual thing in Earth history. Hmm. And so hmm. okay. the the Cambrian was like today in that sense. They didn't have one, uh, from what I can tell, uh, at the North Pole, but there definitely was at the South Pole. And uh, because of that, at least at the start of the period, uh, there was a large amount of glaciation. Uh, are, are in like the center of, of the supercontinent. And because of those glaciers that actually made it so the temperatures were actually fairly similar to today, you know, compared to times like the Cretaceous period or, or a lot of other times that we've had life. Uh, it was still a bit warmer than today. It was about seven degrees Celsius warmer than today, or for, for us Americans, uh, about 12 and a half degrees warmer than today on average. It- in our notes, it says twelve point six in freedom units. Yes, it does. Uh, that's how that's how I refer to any kind of unit that uh, the United States uses, uh, because freedom, um, America. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, twelve and a half degrees in freedom units warmer than it is today, uh, and CO two was also quite high. Uh, it was around sixteen times the parts per million in the atmosphere of like the pre-industrial. Uh, average, so like from like the mid 1800s or so. Uh, yep. And as we were talking about earlier, only about 63 or so percent of modern atmospheric oxygen. However, there weren't things breathing the atmospheric well, oxygen. Well, right. Because the oceans were doing pretty much, I mean, fine. You know, there's probably a bit less oxygen in them, uh, especially because they were a bit warmer. Warmer water tends to hold less gas. So, hmm. uh, it was probably a bit less oxygenated than modern waters are, but life was still doing fine, as we'll talk about. And uh, the climate 
sort of warmed as this period went on, which melted a lot of that South Pole ice cap, which raised sea levels like very, very dramatically throughout the period. So I think at their peak during the Cambrian, they were about 90 meters above what we have today. I mean, that sounds like a lot, but is it? Uh, so 100 meters is about 330 feet. So give or take 300 feet. I mean, that. I, like, I'm assuming in the context of just the way you're phrasing that, like I assume in the context of, you know, geologic sea levels like this is that's really very large so okay. that would be i always that... want to make sure i have like the scales down whenever we're talking this mm-hmm. stuff. like that sounds like a lot but i want to make sure so for example um and i'm just kind of spitballing major cities off the top of my head uh new york la definitely miami um i think even like boston and even like cities around the world like i'm pretty sure like tokyo several big cities in China, uh, all underwater, like dozens, wow. dozens of feet underwater. Okay. And so basically anywhere that is below 300 feet above sea level, you're, you're underwater, you're Atlantis now. Sorry. Um, wow. So we went it's, there. yeah, it's, it's very, very high compared to today, which I mean, that makes sense, right? You know, if you have a lot of ice or a, a lot of water, stored up as ice that's water that's no longer in the oceans so right when all that ice melts sea levels rise that's uh that's some pretty important information for people to know for for today you know no particular mm-hmm. reason no particular reason for that but you know when, when ice melts sea levels rise hmm. who would have thought <laughs> so life didn't really mind that at this point though because, at, like I said, at this point, life was entirely aquatic. And having lots of shallow oceans is generally pretty good for life. So, let's let's talk about some of that life now. So, like I said, this is sort of the first, with, with a big asterisk on it, period, with complex multicellular life. That is what we thought for a very, very long time. That has since not quite turned out to be true. Uh, there is a period right before this, so uh, still in the previous eon. So this is not in the Phanerozoic eon. Uh, I'm blanking. I don't have it in my notes, but I'm fairly sure. Yeah. So the last period of the Proterozoic eon mm-hmm. is called the Ediacaran, and that was named relatively recently. Because we don't generally have enough information about anything older than the Cambrian to to divide it up that nicely, you know, because we make these divisions more or less based off of life. You know, all of the different periods, you know, the Jurassic, the Cretaceous are all split up because we find like a turnover, you know, a a decent amount of things dying uh, or new things showing up. That's where like, okay, these two sections of time are different enough that we want to call them something different and put a line between them. Before the Cambrian, Mm -hmm. we didn't have enough information to do that with anything older than the Cambrian. So, but then there's this little, you know, segment called the Ediacaran period that is right before the Cambrian where I take it. That's pretty important. It's very important. Because the first time that we had seen any multicellular life, really, was the Cambrian up until the Ediacaran biota was found. And we will have a whole episode about the Ediacaran biota at some point. Basically, if you think some of the animals that I'm going to talk about in the Cambrian are odd, we don't even know that some of these things that we see in the Ediacaran are animals. What, we, mm, uh, we will what, talk what about it in a... We will talk about that in a different episode, but... We definitely see things. My interest. We see things that are multicellular, which is important. However, they're all soft-bodied; they don't have any shelled hard parts, which is, you know, as fossils, that's that's what gets preserved. And so we thought that all of these groups show up for the first time in the Cambrian. All of these different 
groups of life that we're going to talk about show up for the first time in the Cambrian? That is probably not true. That's what we thought for a long time. But as we've talked about before, as you learn more in science, it's basically like a, a systematic refutation of lies that you were told when you were younger. <laughs> That's how it's always been described to me. And so uh, being told that the Cambrian is the first time that you see multicellular life is easy because it's the first period of the Phanerozoic Eon, even though that's technically not true. But we're not going to talk about the Ediacaran too much. Okay. Because like I, I said, we don't even, some things, we, like I said, we can't even tell what it is to the point where it's like, are you an animal? Or are you j just this gigantic protist? that I can't really make heads or tails of. I believe Donald Rumsfeld would call these known unknowns. Yes, he sure would. And I would appreciate it if you never bring up Don Rumsfeld <laughs> on this podcast ever again. <laughs> Understood. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So, everything I'm about to tell you is true with an asterisk that there was multicellular life before this, but it's real weird and confusing. And we'll talk about it later. <laughs> so. Okay. okay. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about the plants. Uh, because most people sort of split up, you know, life in like plants and animals. Uh, plants, there really weren't any. Uh, there was some algae. That's about it. No land plants. Uh, seaweed. Or most of like the aquatic plants that you see today are either not actual plants like kelp. Kelp is not a plant. Uh, it, it is uh, an algae or a protist. I don't know off the top of my head. I just know that it's not like technically a plant. Okay. Um, or the types of plants that do exist in the water. Uh, I believe were terrestrial first and then went back to the water. Plants do that too. We've talked about that a handful of times with different animal groups. Plants do that too. So, um, at this point, there were no plants. There were lots and lots of algae or lots of lots of single cellular things uh, doing photosynthesis, which is where, even though there's not a lot of oxygen in the atmosphere, that's where that comes from. Mostly from these single cellular things doing photosynthesis. Okay. So, with the animals... We're going to talk about the animals in general first, before we get into any of these specific animals from the Cambrian. Because the Cambrian period had some real weird animals, but it's best known for it's like when most of the modern large scale groups show up. So most right, of I, this... Oh, go ahead. I assume you're going to get to this, but like when you say large scale groups, what are we talking about before we get to like the specifics? When you say large scale groups, what are we even talking about? Like, so if you remember back to like middle school biology, you have your kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Mm -hmm. We've talked before how it's a lot more complicated than that, but for today, that's fine. Um, so kingdom, it would be your difference between plants, animals, fungus, protists, even though that's a weird just way to split it, but... For example, most people know like kingdom animalia. That's right. all your animals. Everything from sponges to, you know, sharks to mammals, you name it. In the Cambrian, for the most part, we can tell that this is like an animal. Animals for sure showed up before the Cambrian. But the Cambrian is where we have most of the evidence for... All of the different phyla. So the second step down. So the second largest group. At almost as hmm. broad of a group as you can have. So for example. Right. Different phyla uh, that we have today. That would be things like your mollusks. So phylum mollusca. The, you know, mollusks are everything from your clams and other bivalves. Uh, your snails and slugs, your cephalopods, so that would be your octopi, squid, stuff like that. Those are all mollusks. Right. Now, mollusca is a phylum. 
our phylum is chordata. So that would be everything from like hagfish, which don't even have like jaws. They have like they have a mouth. They don't have a jaws. They have a whole lot of other features that we share, mostly things in like the uh like spinal area along their back. Uh where it's like we know that they are chordates, but we don't share a lot else with them. So that is our phylum. There are, I believe, 36 living phyla. And all of them show up in the Cambrian for the first time. So I think that kind of shows just how broad phylum is, if I remember correctly. Because mm -hmm. the, you know, the, the chordates are in the same phylum as us, you said, correct? Yeah, so we, we are chordates. Right, yes. but it is it is such a broad category that you know it encompasses so many different kinds of animals that you need those other classification systems to start getting down into anything that really means anything. Absolutely, and at least uh, to a layperson. Yeah, definitely. And so, uh, like I said, and we actually just found out literally last month because there was one phylum that we did not have fossil evidence for in the Cambrian. It with the first evidence we saw for it was in the next period, the Ordovician. Uh, but literally just in October of 2021, we found some Cambrian evidence for the uh, phylum Bryozoa, which are similar to corals to like most people, except instead of growing like mounds, they grow in like sort of stalks more up off of like a reef instead of like being the reef itself. Anywho, that was really cool news to me because I was like, I'd always learned there's this one weirdo who like should be there, but we don't find it, uh, who mm -hmm. we, we finally found. Uh, Wait, when did we find it? Literally just last month. Or at least it was published Wait, last month. Yeah. Wait, yeah. what? Mm -hmm. It was published okay. last month. I'm not sure when the, when the specimen was actually found. So when this was actually found, you did not have a fiance. <laughs> yes, that is true. Is that, I mean, that's one time frame we can go with. Wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So that, that was like very big news to, I, it didn't make a ton of news because it's not about dinosaurs or human evolution. Um, in science circles, I bet it In is. science circles, that was massive. Uh, just because it was like, finally, like we know they were there, but we just we didn't. We got them. We, we, ladies and gentlemen, we got them. Um, and so I'm way off script at this point. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, with finding that, uh, those, those Bryozoans in the Cambrian, we now have all of the living phyla present in the Cambrian. This is when they first all show up and diversify. M maybe not diversify. Maybe when they first split was a little before a lot of the, the timelines for this thing are really weird because things only fossilize really if they have hard parts, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So but just because all of these different phyla were present doesn't mean that they looked like the versions of them that we have today. So some of the different phyla would look more or less the same, or at least very similar to what we see today. So like uh, sponges, like sea sponges, those would look more or less the same as they do today. Uh, cnidarians, which would be things like your jellyfish, uh, your sea anemones would look very similar to today. Uh, even like some of your, some of the mollusks, I think the first bivalves show up in, in the Cambrian. This would be things that include clams and oysters and such. But a lot of other phyla would not. So like our phylum, Chordata, would not look at all the same. The only chordates that were around at this time look somewhat like, the best thing that I can sort of think of to describe them would be like a cross between a tadpole and like a swimming worm like a leech or something okay that so if you want a good vi visualization there's one genus that there's alive today that i have learned about several times throughout like all of my classes that we sort of use as like an analog for the earliest chordates so we'll, okay. we'll make sure to put this in the show notes but uh, if you want to look it up in real time 
Uh, it's called Branchiostoma. Branchiostoma. Yes. Uh, so it'd be B R A N C H I O S T O M A. Branchiostoma. I'm in a spelling bee now. Um, so I think you won. The, the average person would not point to Branchiostoma and be like, hey, that's my great times several billion uh, grandpa. They'd look at it and be like, oh, that's a weird worm thing. And so our own relatives were not at all the main players in, in their ecosystems at the time. Not, not even close. We were the food. We were the bottom of the food chain, pretty much. <laughs> How things uh, have changed. How the turntables. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and very early on in the Cambrian. So most of what we know about the Cambrian uh, actually comes from a whole bunch of different, uh, I shouldn't say a whole bunch, like a handful of different, like, incredibly well-preserved fossil localities. Uh, one that is very famous that you may or may not have heard of is called the Burgess Shale. Hmm. So that is yeah. a locality in Canada that preserves in, like, incredibly beautiful detail soft body anatomy of lots of different animals that didn't have hard parts yet. Um... Like I said, the Cambrian is known for like the first time, and, and this is something that is actually true, the first time that like hard, shelly parts of animals show up. And that that's why we noticed it first, why we didn't notice, you know, the stuff from the Ediacaran, because that was all still soft bodied stuff. The first time things grow parts that fossilize well is the Cambrian. That's why we noticed it. And thought that this was the first time we had multicellular life because it was just the first time that we had multicellular life that fossilized well. This was the first time we had any kind of, uh, like, uh, fossilized things that fossilized, correct? Not things that fossilized, but things like multicellular things with hard parts. Okay. Single cell things have kind of hard parts, you know, like most of like the photosynthesis going on in the ocean at this time and a large part of it still today uh, are like single celled organisms that have like that make little shells around themselves. So like they have hard parts and they fossilize pretty well, but they aren't like complex multicellular things. Is this the first time we're getting bones? No, no bones yet. Okay. So we're, we're in a sweet spot here. Yeah, absolutely. So most of the hard shelly things that you're finding are especially in the very early Cambrian are uh, part of what's called the small shelly fauna, or you'll very commonly just see it abbreviated SSF. Scientists love our abbreviations. Yes, you do. And so these small shelly fauna were mostly things like early arthropods, which uh, arthropods are things, uh, m you know, living members of the group of arthropods would be things like your crabs, your insects, your spiders, things with like the hard exoskeletons like that. Uh, or things like uh, the other members of the small shelly fauna would be things like your bivalves, uh, things like your brachiopods, which look a lot like bivalves, but are not. Um, things that, it's, it's a pretty descriptive term. They're small and they're shelly. Small and shelly. So that is sort of how you know you are in the Cambrian. And uh, we're not always kind of sure what these animals were. Sometimes we can, you can tell like, oh, this is probably like, maybe like the larval form of some arthropod. Um, but they're really important because, like I said, some of the first things to produce like hard fossilizable shells. And uh, with the development of these hard shells, that sort of paves the way for the next 500 plus million years of at least animal evolution up until all the way to the modern day because what this really kicks off is different kinds of like arms races between predators and prey because up until this point there really weren't too many predators the biggest predators were things that were still eating like those um microbial mats and things. So it's like the only things eating other things were things that were still eating microscopic stuff. So they just sort of move along the, the bottom of the ocean 
and just be sucking up all these bacteria. They weren't actually eating other big multicellular things yet. Okay. Until the Cambrian. Yeah, I, I assume we get that here. Yeah, okay. We sure do. And, but with that, you know, the first, you know, animals that start to eat other things are like, well, I'm going to eat the soft ones or at least have an easier time eating the soft ones. So the, the ones that sort of naturally had maybe a little bit of, you know, calcium in like around their body had a better chance of surviving being attacked by, by a predator. So those ones survived more, had more babies. Those babies then had harder shells and so on and so forth until you have a whole bunch of really armored prey things, which then would put a selective pressure on the predators to become better at eating things with bigger shells and so on and so forth. It just goes back and forth between things get growing bigger shells, things growing bigger to eat those and so on and so forth. So the Cambrian was a really interesting evolutionary like tinderbox of, of that kind of predator prey arms race. Evolutionary tinderbox. Yeah. That's something I just came up. That's not even in the notes. That's just, that's straight off the noggin. Is that a term that you had to copy down for class one day or that's a good one? No, that was straight off the noodle. Uh, (laughs) So the Cambrian period is best known for some of its really weird groups that I've not yet talked about. I've mostly just been talking about things, you know, what our ancestors looked like. Um, and, so we and haven't gotten to the weird stuff. yet. We have not gotten to the really weird stuff yet. And I'm only going to give all a couple right, of examples because I, I could go on all day about some of the weird things that came in. So I'm just going to give you a couple of examples. <laughs> so first we're going to talk about one of my favorites. Um, in that, so I have actually, I'll start off with something else. So the, the, this is when we first see trilobites. Trilobites are a very iconic group of yeah, fossil, of fossil animals. Yeah. So they are arthropods. They look very much... I've heard them described as undersea Roombas. Undersea Roombas. Yes. Just as the Roomba... That seems convenient. Yeah, just like the Roomba sort of scuttles around your house vacuuming up stuff. Um, Mm -hmm. That's more or less what trilobites did. There were lots of other trilobites that actually like swam and and did other things too. But the classic depiction of... uh, trilobites as these little arthropods with lots of legs that sort of just scuttled around the seafloor and um, some of them ate other trilobites some of them just ate those you know microbial mat things or other small things that they just happened to be able to you know scrape up off of the sediment but trilobites are super iconic from the cambrian period because they make it all the way until the end permian or close to the end permian so which was around 250 million years ago so they make it you know getting close to 300 million years so granted considering that they might not be though they're not the weirdest thing around in the cambrian but they're definitely worth a mention here Um, absolutely so some of the actual weirdos from the cambrian now these three for a long time we didn't know even like what they were related to because they are so bizarre the first one is my favorite, at least like name, and it's called Hallucigenia. I was going to ask you about that. Like, is there a mm-hmm. reason it's named that? Yeah. So at first, people were just kind of like, it, am I seeing this right? <laughs> like, like, no, 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 no. Seriously, be honest with me, man. Like, be, be honest with me. Am I, am I seeing this? Yeah, because uh, it's... It's just so bizarre. Is so, it that weird? If you're a paleontologist trying to figure out, like, what is this? Especially back when it was found. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, and we will we will put links to all these in, in the show notes as well. Just like their Wikipedia pages, because that's, that's good enough. Uh, as long as you provide them for me. Absolutely. So, hallucinogenia is sort of a tube like animal that's sort of its main body shape with around 10 slender legs uh on like the the bot like the belly side so like five on each side or so uh the front few 
are very, very slender and pretty featureless, and the back few uh, have like a little claw on the end of them. Uh, okay. But but they're not like jointed, like you think of with like an insect's legs or like or like your legs. They're much more, almost like the best thing that I can think of that most people might be sort of familiar with is like a starfish. Not their arms, the little sucker feet that they have on the underside of their arms. Because it's not like they're like octopus legs. They're just like little tubes that they sort of are very, very flexible. Um, but not in the same way that like octopus arms are. That's not a good explanation. That's why we're putting the links in the show notes. Please go look at these things. I will not do a good job of describing them well enough. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm pulled up some pictures and uh, I don't have a great explanation for this. Yeah, they're very hard animals to describe because they are so unlike anything else we have today. Um, and so they had like the 10 legs on like the belly side and on the back, they have these long slender spikes in two rows going down their, you know, quote unquote back. And very famously, this animal was reconstructed for a long time upside down <laughs> where it would be using the spikes to walk. And people were like, I don't know how it's doing this. I don't well, know how this thing. Get... Yeah. As it turns out though, that's not how it did it most likely. Uh, but the reason that they thought that was because uh, the first specimen that they had only had like one half of the legs preserved so like mm. one one side so it thought it only had the like one row of what they thought were basically like tentacles to catch food or something maybe um okay along the back but they had the two rows of spikes and they were like well just based on what we know about animals they were like well this is a bilateral animal meaning you can cut it in half from head to to butt and it'd be symmetrical on each side. Right. But they only had the one row of like the, what we now know is the legs, what they thought were tentacles. So I thought they, that must've been like down the middle of the back. And they've so got did people figure out what the actual case was here, that it was two rows of legs. Um, in the nineties. Okay. So not that long ago. And then we didn't actually learn, you know, which end was even like the head until like the early 2010s. <laughs> I'm wondering how long it's going to be before we have to do like a correction episode oh, on this podcast yeah, where it's just yeah. like, we, you know, we got something wrong, not because like, you know, we were trying to get something wrong, but because like we learned something new. And as it turns yeah. out, yeah, I, cause mm -hmm. this stuff can be recent, man. Yeah. Uh, and it's funny. It was uh, even suggested at some point, that this animal was not actually the whole animal, that it was, like, a part of a bigger animal, just because, like, this is so weird and doesn't make any sense. Maybe this is, like, the end of a tentacle of something else. Like, like a bigger animal. <laughs> but, nope. Um, so, like I said, please look that up. It's a very strange, and very, honestly, just kind of funny, and it's, like, how we've learned about it since, you know? Right. Uh, but my favorite in terms of like the actual animal is these two somewhat closely related uh, animals called Opabinia and Anomalocaris. So I mentioned Anomalocaris the last episode when talking about uh, the Pokemon Anorith. Yes. And so I'll give another description of it here in a little bit. But these two are, like I said, somewhat closely related. They're both arthropods, like I said, in that same group as crabs and spiders and insects uh but very very unlike the ones that we have today so arthropod means jointed leg or jointed foot technically but these didn't have pretty much anything that you would identify as like a leg so i'm not even sure invertebrates are not my thing so like i've just i've been told that they are arthropods and so i'm choosing to believe it uh, cause you. <laughs> they're so strange. I'm like, sure, I guess. Um, so I, I've since come up with a little bit better of a way since last episode to describe anomaly cars. So imagine an American football, but deflated so that it's kind of flat. Like so how flat? Like, like com com flat? completely, like... Com <laughs> like completely deflated. Like you were just taking it out of the package. 
Like you ordered it in the mail and it's, you got to pump it up yourself. So it's very flat, but very elongated, like oval shape, right? Mm -hmm. And then on each margin, so like uh, where it sort of flips over to the other side, on each side running basically from tip to tip, there are these little wings almost that they sort of undulate from front to back to swim. A bunch of just separate okay. little appendages just... that they basically flap. Oh, okay. And that's how they swam around. Was it like the size of an American football or just the shape? Uh, Anomalocaris could get about that big. Obabinia, definitely not. Obabinia was much smaller. Okay. Uh, only a couple centimeters. Um, which, for my fellow Americans, an inch or two. <laughs> um, but Anomalocaris could get actually quite big, closer to like a foot or even a little bigger, depending on which information you're looking at. Uh, and so Anomalocaris is by far like the biggest predator, like on the world, like in, in the entire planet Earth at the time, at least that we have found evidence for. Uh, it had complex eyes, which was also very new uh, for the time. Eyes were a very new development in the Cambrian. You didn't really need to see until things started trying to eat you. So, uh, and then it became beneficial for predators to then have eyes as well, because you can better find things to eat. So, uh, Anomalocaris has complex eyes that sort of come out off the end of its head, like sort of like a hammerhead shark on either side. Right. And then had the two frontal appendages uh, that brought food into its mouth. So they're sort of similar. Like the, the most comparable thing that I could think of when I was writing this bit was like spider fangs. In that they can't really move too much like side to side, but in sort of just like up and down away and uh, toward the mouth. But they're not like like pointed like spider fangs are. They're much more like arms but they just could only move in the range that you could think of like a spider fang moving. And this was so, for both of them? Nope, that was just for Anomalocaris. Okay, at at least for, the... for, for the eyes and the frontal, the arm things. The rest of the body looked pretty much the same. Gotcha, okay. But for Opabinia, instead of having the two eyes that came out from the side, it had five eyes. Five eyes. Five, which is not a number that you'd normally hear. When you're talking about anything with biology, typically, um, you're normally going with uh, with even numbers. Typically, um, the obvious exceptions are things like your own hands and feet, and like the the default, you know, vertebrate number of digits is five. That's fairly uncommon. Um, mm-hmm. Or you will commonly hear that uh, echinoderms, which would be things like starfish, uh, are pentaradially symmetrical meaning you can cut them in five different ways and it will look the same on each side no matter how you cut them um but that's pretty much it but opabinia had five eyes all on like little short stalks so not quite like gary the snail from spongebob where they're like really long <laughs> off, off the head much shorter and stockier than that uh oh. well, and they were idea yeah they, but they were arranged in uh, sort of like if, if you roll like a dice and it lands on five, how it's like a square and then with one in the middle. Mm-hmm. They arrange sort of like that. But that's not even the weirdest thing about this animal. Come, instead of the two frontal appendages of Anomalocaris, this one had one. But at the end, it had like a grabby hand. Grabby hand. Yes. So if you've ever seen a chameleon, and seen its hands. That's sort of what it looked like. So if you just were wearing like a mitten, more or less, that's sort of what was coming off of its face. So it didn't have really fingers. There were some like almost clawed tips at the end of each side of it, but it could literally just like grab stuff and shove it into its mouth because that was not its mouth. Its mouth was like underneath its head, but it could literally grab stuff and use it as like a full arm grab stuff and shove it into its mouth, which was, you know, under its head. 
that's just so weird. Like I get this so weird, 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 but like it, I'm having a hard time even picturing this. Yeah, it's very strange. Um, which is why, and again, these two will have links in the show notes as well. Um, Anomalocaris, you'll you will probably if you're interested in paleontology at all, you'll probably look at it and be like, oh that. Uh, but Opabinia is just so strange that like. I wish it was depicted more in like popular media because it is so strange and so weird. But uh, it's like I said, it's one of my favorites just because it is so weird. Mm-hmm. Um, so those are the, the three that I wanted to highlight. I could spend days <laughs> talking about all of the strange, weird things that we only recently sort of figured out. Okay. You are a member of this group. Being like, okay, you are arthropods. Editor's this... note, yes, Gavin could spend days talking about this. <laughs> um, but now I want to move on to the last little topic for this episode, and that is the concept of the Cambrian explosion that I mentioned I at have, the beginning. I have heard this a number of different times. I know I've heard it in Bill Wurtz's History of the Entire World, yes. I guess. Like, I, I am familiar with this as a concept, and you have teased that this might not have actually been a thing, so... So Blow it my is, mind again. It was. Pr- it probably was a thing. It was probably just much more understated than we traditionally have thought. So, like, not the Cambrian explosion, but the Cambrian pop or something. Right. So, okay. The Cambrian explosion traditionally refers to a huge radiation and like evolution of all of these groups. You know, of all of these different phyla, these big, large scale groups. Hmm. Um, but now as we, as we've talked about throughout this entire episode, that's might not actually be the case. You know, these groups may have sort of been present in the Ediacaran before the Cambrian, but they just didn't have hard parts. So we didn't know. And so all of these groups developing hard parts at the same time, uh, you know, that's what we first find. And it's like, wow. All of these things show up at the same time, or very, very close to the same time. And so it was thought that there was some kind of massive explosion of biodiversity. Seems reasonable. Right. And if, if that's the information that you have to work on, is only the hard parts, that is a very reasonable conclusion to come to, is that something about the environment of the world at this time facilitated this huge diversification of uh, all these different groups. But now that we have a lot better fossils from the Ediacaran and from the Cambrian, uh, especially of like soft body stuff, that's, that's no longer really the case. So it's been, we've, we've been sort of shifting like scientific consensus more toward it being like a Cambrian pop. Or you'll, you'll most likely these days hear it if you like were to read any, you know, recent scientific publications referred to as like the Cambrian radiation. Because there, there is a very real, you know, amount of diversification. It was just not nearly as big of like the large scale groups as we once thought it was. And I just pulled up the Wikipedia page for Cambrian explosion, and that is the title. But right at the beginning, it says the Cambrian explosion or Cambrian radiation. Mm-hmm. So even right there, it seems like there's a, uh, you know, a slow changing of terminology that's taking place. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so, like I said, the Ediacaran, or maybe even before that, because to my knowledge, we have very poor fossils from before the, the Ediacaran. Um mm-hmm that might have actually been when all of these phyla actually diversified from one another. And we just don't have the proper fossils to tell that. And that's actually sort of backed up based on genetic data that we have from living organisms today. You know, I tend to not put a whole lot of different stock in these sort of genetic clock type of, of analyses, but they've done gotten quite a lot better even in the last handful of years, I've noticed. So, okay. Uh, either way, still lots of diversification in the Cambrian period, but probably not as much as is historically 
thought, or at least as I learned when I was, you know, an, an up and coming young geologist. So it's still important to know, like a thing that, you know, would get a mention on this podcast regardless, but, you know, Cameron explosion might be a bit of an overstatement. Is that the, uh, the crux of it? Yeah, more or less, but that's, like I said, still not to downplay the Cambrian because it is a very fascinating time just about learning about the early evolution of ecosystems, really, because ecosystems, as we understand them today, didn't really exist before the Cambrian, and that's something that we can say fairly confidently. Really? Yeah, because... Ecosystems? Wow. Well, because, like I said, things eating each other at least in terms of multicellular things, eating other multicellular things, wasn't really a thing from what we can huh. tell. All of the Ediacaran biota that we found are, A, like I said, very weird, but they don't have anything that we could really be interpreted as like predator adaptations. Pretty much all of them were even more undersea Roombas than trilobites were just things and i guess scooting. if you boil ecosystem mm -hmm. right down to it like things eating each other that's yeah that's about as kind of bare wow okay huh i get that's like a puzzle piece that clicked in for me there right at the very end that's what i aim for that's that's what you should <laughs> aim for and that's what you're going to be getting on the next 50 episodes of i wish you were dead a podcast about things that used to be alive my name is Mike and that is Gavin. Gavin, here's to the next 50. Absolutely, buddy.